Karen. Yes. There are so many types of meditation out there. True. Right? There's yeah. loving kindness. There's sitting in stillness. There's heart centered. There are binaural beats and mindfulness meditations. Mm -hmm. There are even sound bath meditations. Mm -hmm. But what if I told you that there is actually only one meditation that you need in order to manifest your life's purpose? Ooh, I want to know that one. Uh huh. And what if <laughs> that one meditation was about to be revealed to us on this week's show? Well, that would make me very excited. Uh -huh. I'd say <laughs> let's get on with the show. So here we go. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something, anything, that will prove that there's something beyond this physical, three dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Hey there, I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we've got a special treat for you. He's an entrepreneur, a twice published and best selling author, a podcast host, a yoga teacher, co owner of Blue Osa Yoga Retreat and Spa in Costa Rica, and the creator of the revolutionary approach to yoga, applied yoga anatomy, plus muscle activation, otherwise known as Ayama. It's easy for me to say, right? <laughs> Now, he's journeyed from the wilds of Canada to New York City, where he started the global men's naked yoga movement to the sacred Himalayas, where his leg was crushed by a boulder in a freak accident while trekking, to the uh, untamed jungles of Costa Rica, where he built a thriving yoga retreat center, to today, where he's on a mission to help as many people as possible live a pain-free life by teaching his revolutionary approach to yoga. And he says... He's accomplished all of this, not because he's fearless or extraordinary, although I'm sure he is, but because he had a powerful meditation practice alongside him throughout it all. And he's about to reveal to us what that one meditation practice we all need to manifest our life's purpose today. Excited to talk to him and welcome to the show, Yogi Aaron. How are you? I am better now. Can you introduce me every day as I wake up out of bed? I love it. You, you know, I've always told Karen, I need to record someone saying something like that and just carry it around with me. So whenever I walk into a room, I've got this introduction, you know. Yes. It, 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 it's so, it's so, it's not, so much nicer when someone says, you know, stuff about you. So, um, Well, as long as it's good stuff. Well, well that's I mean, true. But it's not just stuff. It's because it's I hear people read, you know, things about me all the time. But it's that you do it with such enthusiasm and oh. gusto. That's well, what, like, there you go. got me going. It's just well, like, wow, I, I need that enthusiasm I, daily I, in my I, life. I have been accused of having lots of gusto. That's for sure. <laughs> Among other things. But we'll just stick with the gusto. Right. No, we call it gusto. Still here, bro. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited to talk to you because I, I, I mean, you're, you're super intrigued to learn what that one meditation practice is. But we're going to make everybody wait just a minute because uh, one of the things, as I was researching you, one thing I found about you that I was, I was astounded by, it, your type of yoga, like mm -hmm. you have a very unorthodox approach, right? You to the point of Karen, get this. He believes, he feels mm -hmm. that stretching might actually do more harm than good. Ooh. Ha, ha, what? Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing it wrong all along. How so? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I never like to say anybody's been doing it wrong, but they've been, We've been doing it wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, we don't know what we don't know until we know that we didn't know. I mean, you know, we can go back in, in medical history and see so many examples of the craziness that, mm -hmm. um, you know, these people thought, but yeah, I, I started getting into yoga cause I was tight. I was very athletic and I thought like most people I need to stretch and mm -hmm. it's, it's a natural progression. Cause if you look at people as they age, they tend to become more, uh, closed in. And I always observed people that looked youthful and were older had more openness, more spring in their step, more mobility. So I got into yoga. I started stretching. And the very short story is it took me 25 years to realize it was the stretching that was causing me more pain. As soon as I started stretching, I developed back problems, knee problems, neck problems, lower back problems, 
all kinds of problems. And I never put two and two together until I ended up in a surgeon's office in an emergency room wanting to do a spinal fusion on my lower back. After doing this kind of stretching practice to be younger and be more youthful <laughs> and virile, at the age of 45, they're wanting to do a spinal fusion. And I actually know wow. many people in their 40s, early 40s even, who have had hip replacement surgeries and who are yoga teachers. So really, it's wow. something isn't going right. And then that led me into studying the neuromuscular connection between what actually happens when we stretch. And I mean, nothing I'm saying is, is you know, made up. It's scientifically verified. These are, you know, pe people with PhDs will tell you, yeah, that's exactly what happens. Um, and so the short, the short answer is that when we stretch, we actually desensitize our nerve endings and those we desensitize our nerves so that the communication system between the nerves or the central nervous system and the muscles becomes desensitized. So when you need those muscles to support your body, aka like you're bent over, you pick something up, you know, if your muscles aren't contracting properly, all of a sudden the body's not stable. What does it do? It tightens up. And then that's when you hear people say, oh my God, my back just went out or mm. I've got this huge kink in my neck. Those kinks in your back going out is a protective mechanism from your body to tighten up. So when your body it feels like it, it's, it needs to, um, it's unstable, it will just tighten up. And mm. so stretching is the absolute wrong thing to do. I know many people like to go, well, that's your opinion and this is my practice. Well, you can keep disabling your body if you keep stretching. That's up to you. <laughs> and end, right. up a, end up yeah. in an in a emergency room. <laughs> yeah. See, Karen, I, and that, that is why I don't do yoga because I don't want to desensitize my nerves. I always mm, knew it all along. Lie? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Yogi, Aaron, I'm... I'm the worst. Like when you, like the you're, worst. you're talking about tight, like I can't, yeah. I can't, don't even think about touching your toes. I can't touch my knees. I mean, it, I yes. am so crazy Bad. tight. It's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> and, and I've tried yoga before and inevitably I end up yeah. more in more pain than when I started. In fact, when, we, when Karen and I first started dating, she took me to Bikram yoga and that was like hell. Like I, <laughs> not only was I in pain, but I was in pain and sweating my ass off while I was in pain. It was terrible. Like, like awful. <laughs> So then if, if stretching is not what we're supposed to be doing when we're doing mm -hmm. yoga, aren't you supposed to, when you're going into yoga poses, aren't you stretching? I, yeah, I'm, for, I don't teach stretching anymore. It's just the way that you approach certain postures. You're also, I mean, one of the number one rules of what I teach is just go to 30% of your, what you think is your range of motion. Like if you're going to do a stretch, only go to 30%. Um, but the tightness that you're experiencing is just your, you know, it's just a symptom of that connection between your brain and your muscles not working properly. That neuromuscular connection has become compromised due to stress, due to trauma, due to overuse, you know, overuse, by the way, could be as simple as you sitting for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So that's like mm -hmm. an overuse of your body in a stagnant posture. And that starts to compromise that neuromuscular connection. So if we get that communication system working properly, you can have mobility back happening really quickly. But the tightness you're experiencing is your body protecting itself. It's like if you walked on ice, you know, like you step out on ice, what do you do? You freeze up literally. Mm -hmm. So there's an autonomic nerve uh, response to go into a protective state. But I just wanted to say, Karen, oh my God, throwing Will into the fire, like with Bikram, <laughs> literally 120 I mean, degrees. No. Quite literally. It felt like my entire neurons were on fire. Well, he didn't have yeah. to come. He was oh, in that yeah. still trying to impress mode. Uh, that, which which uh, translates to have to come, Karen, if you don't, you know. Don't know the way that I things think go. You came twice, right? Didn't you? Well, twice. And the, and the second time, I, you almost have to call the paramedics. No, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> It was Clearly that bad. He was bad. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I got mad Bikram skills, baby. Because <laughs> it's wet like nobody's business. <laughs> so when you uncompromise the communication, can how flexible can you be? Like I in high school and then I was on a dance team. I mean I could do like sure. all the splits and kicks and everything. 
can I get back to that? Or is that well, just like, forget those days? <laughs> I mean, I no, I yes and no. I mean, the first question I always ask people is why? Like, why do you know. want that? And then the second question, the follow-up question. She had great hair back then. That's why. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then it's more about what we looked like. But no, but the the bigger question is, you know, how much flexibility do you need to have to be happy? We have a young daughter. Yeah. She's 12 and she's starting to do sports and stuff. And I want to be able to do a lot of that stuff with her and not cry. And not be paralyzed. (laughs) So. Yeah, so I would just say you want to make sure that you are functioning optimally and that the communication system is working properly throughout your body. You know, how long will that take for you to get there? That just depends on history. It depends on what you're bringing to the table. But the answer is I, I ended up in the surgeon's office. It was six years ago. And pretty quickly, due to all of the work that I was doing on myself, I was able to actually get back into hiking and doing all kinds of stuff that I thought I would never do again. And now I'm 51 and I feel stronger today than I have in a long time, long, long time. So, and, and I would also point out like one of the things that always fascinates me is, is sometimes I'll bend over and I'll pick something up and I'll be like, huh, there's no tightness in my body right now. My body is working well. <clears throat> like I don't have my hamstrings pulling on me. I don't have my back like screaming mm-hmm. at me. And that's a sign that I'm actually, my body is working really well. So mm. how much, you, the, again, the question is always like why and then how much flexibility do you really need? I never really make that the goal. What my teacher Greg always says is when you have stability, you will have all the mobility in the world that you could possibly want. So just to clarify for the slow yep. person in the room, um, <laughs> when, you, when you're talking about getting to, I think you said 70%. So ideally what you're trying not to do is overstretch, right? You you do need to stretch a little bit or it's just no. like go beyond, really, you know, no. not stretching at all. No, no, because what we've forgotten and, and it's like, you know, humans, as you know, have incredible amnesia, amnesia, amnesia. I'm sorry, what was your name? (laughs) (laughs) So let me get, let me tell you, like there's a pose, like I'll pull out a Bikram pose because I've done Bikram a lot. So Mm -hmm. one of the Bikram is you come over to the side, the side Mm -hmm. bending pose. And usually they'll cue it like, go, 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 go. And try and feel the stretch on the side body. But in the way that I would set that up, and I wouldn't, I would almost do it the same would have actually people cross their arms and do it. But instead of focusing on the stretch, what are actually the muscles that is moving the body in that pose? The muscles that are moving the body is the lateral obliques and quadratus lumborum and a few of the other side bender muscles. So what you want to do is you want to activate those. So when you're coming over, I would cue it more like squeeze the, the shoulder to the hip. And now you're engaging all of those muscles properly. It's not a focus on trying to stretch. And what we've forgotten, again, the amnesia thing is the role of muscles. So muscles always work in pairs. There's there's a muscle that's contracting. It's called the agonist. And there's the other muscle that's relaxing. That's the antagonist. And so in yoga, where we've gone wrong in a lot of this kind of stretching ideas that we're focusing on getting the agonist to actually go longer than it should be instead of focusing on the muscle that should be contracting. If we focus on that more, then we increase our range of motion. And there's 100% accountability. If I'm just focusing on stretching, the, the, the whole nerve connection gets discombobulated. And is that a word? And it is, it is today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there's no accountability. And then we lose the muscle connection. And you see that happen a lot. Like, think about Bikram classes. People get up. They're not like bouncing up. They're like crawling up, pulling themselves. Because they're in a puddle on the floor. (laughs) None of their muscles are working properly. They've all been like that whole neuromuscular connection is just gone. And so people don't have that like what some people call force output. There's no force output in the muscles. Muscles should always be able to contract and contract on demand. When they don't, there's a problem. And the Mm. result of that is stress in the joints and the result of stress is pain. So that's why I'm Mm. on a mission to help people become pain-free. 
You know why? I love Ooh, it. I want to sign up because holy ah. crap, I've been in pain since <laughs> I blame COVID because I started working from home and yeah. Will was working from home and our daughter was homeschooling. And so they got the good spots and I got the couch. So I sat on the couch with my laptop for a couple of years and now my back, it's terrible. It's just yeah. terrible. Sure. Yeah. Blame it on us. I uh-huh. do. I you got the that. office scene. I got the dining room. I got the couch. <laughs> right. But now the office is sitting empty the all day, every day. Now you, we're both sitting on the couch instead. Well, now because I can't sit anywhere but the couch because I'm so messed up. <laughs> you, be, you become one with the couch. <laughs> hey. You fuse with the couch. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this, this is fascinating because I, I've studied a little bit of Hinduism, right? And you, Hindus all about yoga, mm-hmm. but their yoga is, sure. I mean, they, they really specifically talk about stretching in order to reach the 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 mindfulness thing, right? So th- this yeah. is maybe not exactly what the Hindus were, were thinking about when it comes to yoga. We're, you're talking more of a Western physiology, let's keep ourselves healthy and young as much as possible, long as possible. There's a well, lot to unpack in in that statement, uh-huh. um, but I'm going to keep it, I'll keep it really short and just <laughs> leave it at this. And if you want more, you can ask me, but in, in the yoga scriptures, there's actually no reference to having to become flexible. There's oh. nothing. Well, and then that's it's, one it's of the... the that's a big misconception in, in, in the West, like, cause we see these lanky, sinewy, you know, 18 year old men, uh, doing these incredible things. But as I would say to Karen, who, as she goes to a Bikram class wanting to look like them, you know, are you really an 18 year old, lanky, <laughs> sinewy Indian boy? <laughs> not this time around. She's not. <laughs> you can attest Bus, to that. meet Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have to say about that for now. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I won't out then who it is, whose book I read, but it's a, an Indian who came over to the sure. States who established an ashram who that, that is pretty well known. Reading his book talks about being flexible. So it, hmm, a lot to unpack, like Maybe it means flex, flexible of the mind. <laughs> Maybe you misunderstood I, the whole book. <laughs> Damn it. I can't speak to that, but all I can tell you is that in scriptural reference, there is no reference to the importance of flexibility. Yeah. Um, and what what has happened is, and if you look at a lot of the teachers as they as they age, they actually don't really do much asana. Asana is like something engineered for us to, I mean, I could go on and on and on about it, but it's really something for us to get a grip of our mind. And so there's only two things that we have to master in order to master posture, and that's stillness <laughs> and then joy uh, or ease and effortless, which is the, you know, the result is joy. So yeah. if, if we can embody those two things, then we can master asana. And it's interesting because the whole idea of that teaching it's scripturally referenced in, in Sutra 246. 248, he says, if you can master those two qualities, you can overcome all the pairs of opposites of life, meaning that neither pain or pleasure will pull you in any direction, that you just become this steadfast pillar of steadiness uh, mm-hmm. in the world. And for that, me, that's that's a powerful teaching. No mm-hmm. doubt about it. And I know now for sure that I'm doing it wrong because stillness and joy, when I do yoga, I do shakiness and pain. So... <laughs> It is not at all what I'm trying to be doing here. <laughs> Can I just tell you something? You're what I always refer to. I, I have two archetypes when I'm doing my Uh-oh. teacher trainings, and one Uh-oh. of them is called Stiff Biff, and you are just probably, oh my God. You probably would so be my Stiff, stiff biff. biff in the class. <laughs> I'm going to get you a t-shirt, Will. You know, <laughs> I, you know I, I, might, I might actually wear it. I think it, it fits really well. I don't know. <laughs> By the way, women can also be stiff biff. It's it's gender neutral. So <laughs> mm, yeah, it's pretty agnostic. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, this has been fascinating. We just getting started, and we already have to take a break. So if you will just bear with us, when we come back, we're going to talk about that one meditation practice that we teased at the beginning of the show because this is what the whole reason we brought Yogi Aaron into the show, and we've yet to touch on it. But I promise you, when we come back, we're going to dive into it. So stay with us. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We are speaking to Yogi Aaron, who is mm, 
enlightening us with the fact that we are doing it wrong. <laughs> and I'm talking about yoga, of course. Uh, right before the break, we talked about the fact that in scripture, there was nothing that said that you have to be flexible. And you're right. Thinking back on the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, everything I've read, I, I don't recall ever hearing anything about being stretchy. So, uh, <laughs> being stretchy. <laughs> right. So I appreciate you giving us a whole new perspective on yoga because it is completely different than anything we've, I mean, it is completely anti-intuitive. Like it is completely opposite of everything we've ever heard about in yoga in the Western world. It's incredible. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, before we left, and in the beginning of the show, and in the middle of the show, and every other time, except for <laughs> when we were, you know, we, talk, we talked about this one meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Now, you've done a lot in your life and a lot of struggles that ultimately came out to be really good things, but you had to overcome. Mm -hmm. You mentioned meditation practice, and everyone who listens to the show knows how important meditation is. I mean, it, it is a no-brainer. It's a, the first step. It is a do not pass go, do not collect 200 bucks. This is, you've got to meditate if you want to move down this path. Whatever path you decide, meditation seems to be the gateway drug for all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yet you say, it is where you got my attention. You say that there is one practice that you must do to manifest your life's purpose. Yogi Aaron, <laughs> I must know what this practice is because I'm doing a thousand roll. of them and <laughs> I need to know because I have not found it yet. And this is the ever elusive meditation practice. Okay. Yogi Aaron, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh my God. I just felt the pressure go up like so many notches. So right. There's a couple of things that I kind of want to tee up first, but one of them is so I was on the train uh, coming from Vancouver to New York, and I, I decided for some crazy reason, which I never recommend to anybody else, to take the train from you know West Coast to East Coast or vice versa. It's one of the most horrible experiences you'll well, ever uh, have as on Amtrak. Have, as as, and, on well, yeah, I was going to say, if you have a sleeper car, it might not be so bad. But if you're just sitting there like in an airline seat next to the guy next to you sleeping on your shoulder, because I did that. And that's not fun. <laughs> wasn't fun, but I was in my, you know, late twenties and trying to save a buck and I had my big bags and I was moving to New York and it was really moving there without any money in my pocket. And, but everything inside of me, you know, I'd been doing yoga for a little while and, and I felt like my Dharma, my purpose was pushing me to, uh, New York and I couldn't explain why just everything inside of me was just saying, go to New York study yoga, teach. I know it's a weird idea. Like, why would you go to New York to uh, study <laughs> yoga? But you know, there's so many great yoga teachers in New York sure. and yeah, very international and city. I kind of like intuitively just picked it out. And so anyways, I was on the train and I was just feeling that kind of terror. Um, it was really the first time in my life at that point that I was kind of doing it on my own in many ways. I'd done yeah. stuff on, uh, clearly on my own before, but just feeling that kind of terror uh, bubbling yeah. up. And one of the things that I really felt as that terror was bubbling up was how paralyzing fear is in terms of being, you know, of, of tapping into that inspirational source of that well of creative ideas like that, that flow just stops like all of a sudden. And so I kind of closed my eyes and this meditation practice kind of dropped in. Now, before I tell you what it is. Oh my God, um, Yogi. <laughs> I'm learning something from watching you. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to jump ahead. And um, so when I went to New York, part of my mission was to find a teacher. Like I really mm -hmm. wanted a teacher. And this idea of Tantra started coming up for me, partly because of the work I was doing with the men and then partly because of other things. And I was like, what is this Tantra business? And uh, so I happened to pick up a uh, magazine from Kripalu and there was right on, on one of the pages, Living Tantra. And I had met my teacher, Rod. And so one of the things that Rod tore the veil back between the seen and the unseen for mm. me. I was able to begin to get a glimpse of the sacred self. And I'd never experienced that before. But one of the most interesting things was 
that my big takeaways was this idea of Tantra. So a lot of people think of Tantra as like sex and, you know, uh, the yoga of sex. And usually if they go to a Tantra yoga workshop, they want to get rid of the yoga and get to the sex. So, um, <laughs> I mean, who does it? I mean, <laughs> I, that was all me going to Bikram Yoga. You. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oops, I say that out loud. So Sorry about that. <laughs> So what, but the actual definition of Tantra means to become limitless, to, to move beyond all limitations. That's the literal translation of Tantra. So sitting on the train, I kind of started tapping into this, this meditation practice, this affirmation, this bhavana in Sanskrit, the word we often use is bhavana, like something that you can really feel in your heart. And the word bhav actually denotes like love. So to bring love into an idea and this affirmation just kind of dropped into my space and it was, I'm opening myself up to the universe of limitless possibilities. and. I just dropped into that practice literally on the train on the way to New York. And the most amazing things started happening. The fear immediately started to vanish. The creative source of inspiration just started opening up to me. And that kind of, I would say like this sense of indomitable willpower that each human being possesses became like a great force within me. Uh, and you know, after moving to New York and, and of course, when the train landed and, you know, and I got home and stuff like that, that fear obviously came back time and time and time again. I had so many setbacks those first few months and that, but the saving thing, the thing that got me through the thing that, that kept my focus, um, that kept me on my path of, of purpose and intention was that meditation practice. And any time I would just start to go into that fearful place, I was able to capture that bhavana, that idea, that feeling, that af affirmation, um, and remember who I was. And that's the point of, I think, meditation. I mean, meditation has many different levels to it. At the source, a meditation practice should bring us immediately, like in a split second, uh, back to who we are at our source and so that we can tap into that intuitive wisdom, that indomitable willpower, um, that creative source of inspiration. And the funny, the reason why I told the story about my teacher is because that idea of Tantra is the embodiment of what just kind of dropped into me, you know. I, I call it sometimes spiritual downloads. You know, we get those spiritual downloads mm -hmm. and those, those spiritual downloads, you know, that, that one that I had on the train is the one that kind of propelled me to starting in New York with nothing, opening up a yoga studio, which went worldwide to opening up a yoga retreat center. So, mm. uh, wow. be careful what you open yourself up to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it all sounds great. So I have a question about um, something that Will mentioned in the introduction. You were hiking, and you yes. like your your leg got crushed. That sounds yes. horrible. Now my question is: Was that before you started doing um, this type of yoga, or was it after? And did this help you heal? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. No, I hadn't started the Ayama path yet. I was still okay. a regular yoga teacher. Having said that, my my spiritual practice of yoga and even somewhat the physical, um, and that's a bigger discussion, but the, the spiritual practice prepared me for that, uh, event. Cause when it happened, I was in the middle of the Himalayas. I was 26 kilometers away from the vehicles and my femur literally broke in half. Like you see ah. the x-ray, it was like that. And Sounds so I get, I, I feel like everything in my life prepared me for that moment. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm opening myself up to the universe of limitless possibilities. <laughs> um, right. Really? Yes. No, no yeah. joke. And so, but after that, on a physiological level, everything that was wrong with me before, physiologically speaking, <laughs> just became <laughs> exacerbated and, and worse and, so it, it didn't help things, but I had started 
glimpsing into the world of muscle activation and mm-hmm. what was going on at that level. But since then, I would say like I'm a lot stronger now than I ever was. So that and feels really I, good. I would think an injury like that would have like lasting pain and kind of repercussions. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like what you're doing maybe has been really helping it. Yeah, absolutely. It sound like something you just get over. <laughs> No, I mean, I had to wear a knee brace for a long time. If I did any walking for an extended period of time, now I don't have to wear any braces or any supports or anything like that. That's great. Yeah. So then let's get a little bit into the, what's uh, Ayama? Ayama, Hmm. yes. Ayama, your technique, for lack of a better word, your approach, that's a better word, your approach Mm -hmm. is quite revolutionary, right? What makes... Ayama different than most yoga practices out there? (laughs) Well, the biggest one, so there's kind of a twofold question because I'm always using this coin, like we're trying to flip the script in the yoga world Mm -hmm. and stop making it about stretching and flexibility. And so part of it, my focus is to bring yoga back to what it's supposed to be about. You know, how often do we ever go into a yoga class and hear a teacher talking about how our practice can help us to manifest and live our life purpose. I never, um, <laughs> never hear a yoga teacher talking about that asana is, you know, the goal of asana is to help us become these steady forces in life where nothing pulls us in either direction, that we have a clear sense of purpose in who we are. And I think that's one of the biggest shames of this biggest, you know, this marketing thing. So that's one part of a Yama. And the the other part that makes it very different is, well, number one, stop stretching. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. right, And start activating. And so a lot of what I do is I, I kind of flip the script in terms of, you know, what Karen was talking about before, about wanting to put her foot up behind her head and, you know, and do all of those marvelous things. It's kind of asking, it's kind of getting people back into, let's use our yoga practice so we can become, so that we can stand well in life and not have pain. Um, and, and checking in with ourselves and, and using that as a tool to, you know, push us forward in life rather than, you know, the, the whole um, idea of like putting your foot behind your head or learning to stand on your hands or, whatever it is, those are all kind of distractions at the end of the day, you know, and this is where the, the idea of posture can be the key to your liberation or the box of your own prison. There's so many people that are so focused on making something, make their body look a certain way that they've completely missed the mark and what the asana, you know, the asana is there to get you free, not to imprison you into a shape. <laughs> mm, mm. So basically what I'm hearing mm. here is that when you do yoga, it's not supposed to hurt. It should well, never hurt. It should never <laughs> hurt, Karen. See, never it hurt. never, never hurts hurt. Me. Never hurt. Hurts you? Oh never, God. ever. <laughs> it is impossible. <laughs> now, did you not see me shaking and be- beating up and sweating? <laughs> stuff? That's because I'm trying not to scream in pain. I blocked that out. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking away. I wanted to be impressed. Mm. all right now we've established the fact that stretching is bad Uh, we got to stretch bad flex i mean we used i mean flexibility is good but but not stretching stretching is bad so it is there i mean even you know back in junior high when you're doing gym class and the first thing you do is put your right leg over your left leg and you bend down and you you (laughs) stretch is there a, a safe way to stretch or should we just not stretch at all like maybe get like get up in the morning and just keep ourselves like in a little bundle and walk to the shower and no stretching allowed or (laughs) (laughs) well there's there's nothing wrong with like if you bring your okay bring your arms up to the sky now don't move your chest now bring your biceps behind your ears a little bit more do you feel your back muscles working Mm yeah okay so what are those back muscles doing they're shortening they're contracting And so that is a great movement, by the way, that's a fantastic way to start activating your trapezius muscles. If you bring your arms out at 45 degrees and just bring them back, you're going to feel your lower traps starting to engage, which is a great thing. Now, do you feel sort of a sense of opening in your chest? Absolutely. When the, when the, when the trapezius muscle shortens, the result is the pecs start to relax. You're not trying to stretch the pecs. You're trying to engage the trapezius muscles. 
So when you engage, when you come at it from that perspective, if I'm my focus now is engaging my traps, the pecs are going to start to naturally release. Now, some people might want to call that a stretch. I, I don't it, biomechanically. It's just they just relax. That's what's mm. happening. They mm-hmm. just they have to relax so that the trapezius can contract. Now, the tightness in the chest is not is a symptom of the traps not being able to contract properly. And mm-hmm. the result of them not contracting properly, guess what, is tight neck all the way up into the top of your neck. Yeah, the, the lower traps are, are actually the opposite of the upper traps. And so the upper traps tighten up because the lower traps are not doing their job properly. Oh my God, it's fascinating. I'm constantly dealing with this different neck. Constantly. Always. See, it's migraines nonstop. Mm, gosh. <laughs> I got to ask though, because as we've already established, I am stiff biff and I can't yes. get into the postures. How yes. could I possibly get into a posture if I don't stretch my way into it? Like if there's- well, the- if you are folding you forward and you said earlier that you couldn't touch your knees, the question is, okay, so what are the muscles that are contracting to bring you forward? Well, now we're looking at a lot of your, uh, let's call it the APAC, you know, your rectus abdominis. We're also That's looking right. at our oblique mm-hmm. muscles. Yes. Wow, you, 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 find them. You've seen my pictures <laughs> on Facebook, haven't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening is, those muscles are not shortening properly. And that's why you're feeling the tightness. They're, they're in a kind of static state. They're not working properly. So what we want to do is get those muscles working. And if I did, I could probably get you to increase your range of motion quite dramatically. Wow. wow. True story. Mm-hmm. True story. So do you have videos that you that people can can get and watch how how can can, she's, she's asking how can will <laughs> yes, actually get much. to where you're much. saying <laughs> <laughs> so yeah people can access all my content on yogi Aaron.com. it's sort of the gateway into the yogi club uh into my youtube channel into the book which is called stop stretching my podcast series called stop stretching I also, if you fish around on my site, and maybe I'll put it in the in the show notes, is the link to the affirmation series that we've, you know, because I created a 28-day affirmation series. That one that I shared with you is one of them. And it's all about, you know, using these to manifest and live your life purpose. But that's how people can access uh, what I'm doing. I have a pain-free series that's right on my site as Ooh, well. Oh, I like that. So it takes people through it, kind of like trying to educate people a little bit on how they can live their best pain-free life and why they're experiencing pain and what they can do about it. Mm, yeah, we're definitely going to add all those links yeah. to our show notes. Yogi Aaron, where have you been all my life? <laughs> or just the last I'm, 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> now, I think we would be doing our listeners a disservice if I did not ask about something Will mentioned. Uh-oh. Yes. He, I, you know, you mentioned it. I got to ask. Are we do- naked oh. men yoga. <laughs> yes. What is that? I, I knew it. And why I are they naked? It. I knew it. I was waiting so, to see if we can get through the show without you bringing it up. Bring that up. And that's not, that's not something that you just mentioned and don't explain. <laughs> like a hit and run. <laughs> yeah. You, can, you know, people out there are going, come on, come on, get to the naked men yoga part. <laughs> no, I, I think one particular person in the no. audience. Is that. <laughs> so. So I just have to specify, I was opening myself up to the universe of limitless possibilities. <laughs> and you were opening up in all kinds of ways. <laughs> and, you know, what? when I was actually in New York, I remember the day really well. I was with a friend and I was walking and I happened to be walking across Sixth Avenue, which is the Avenue of Americas. And it I was, was in just the middle of the that. street and the top of my head opened up and this idea came into my head it was like oh my god hot nude yoga and um and you know i i did it i started it for a few reasons but one of them was i just feel like men are sort of an underserved community in the world of yoga and i wanted to create a safe space and and, and a fun space for men to come and just be men and, um, and what better way to do that? And yeah, like, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, when men get together, it's a powerful thing. Just like when women get together, mm-hmm. it's a very powerful experience. And I just 
saw, like, you know, my idea was to do it for six months and then call it a day and, you know, move on. Mm -hmm. It ended up becoming this like, you know, global phenomena, which is a whole other story. But it's just the community that came out of that was just incredible and mm -hmm. one of the most enriching times of my life. Well, I mean, I, I understand like, you know, going skinny dipping and stuff and, and just something about <laughs> being out and, and naked. It's very freeing, but yes, I don't think I'd want to be bending around a bunch of naked women. <laughs> I, would, I would be so self-conscious. Right. <laughs> Have you never played Naked Twister, Karen? <laughs> Actually, no. Oh, oh me either. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I mean, does that, it take people to warm up, you know, like to kind of are they uncomfortable at first? And then the group kind of starts can, feeling more comfortable. Can like? you start with toga yoga and then work <laughs> your way to <laughs> thong yoga? <laughs> no, it was an all or nothing, baby. Yeah. Uh, uh. No, there was no, and you know, you know how many times I got emails from people wanting just to come and watch the class. Oh my oh, God. Oh my God. Really? Uh, uh, I mean, uh. yeah, really, they had the nerve. Well, I'm I not think so I sure saw that on Cinemax. The class. <laughs> <laughs> my back's a little stiff. I don't but, think I can do it, but I want to know it, you know. A big uh -huh. part of it was coming outside your comfort zone. And I can just say from my own younger, younger, younger years, nudity was always a big issue for me. I grew up in a very religious household mm -hmm. uh, in my younger years. And so the idea of getting naked, and I remember when I started to, and I, I just felt liberated. I felt free. And I felt like there was like something around me that had just come off and I was like, hey, here I am. Um, and so that's also was a big part of it was just people taking a leap of faith and and just getting outside of what, the, you know, becoming limitless. That's the mm -hmm. definition of Tantra. Yeah. Become limitless. Go and beyond this, your limitations. Is it still going on now? It's become a worldwide, you know, phenomena. There's right. been chapters of men's groups that have opened up all over the place one of the things that i oh i should not be saying this right now but anyways <laughs> i actually created a ton of videos and um that are out uh, there and oh. so part of my intention was to put those videos out and at the very least like these different men's groups could put them on play and do them together or mm -hmm. you know other people would become inspired by them and start teaching you know their own groups which is what exactly happened so uh. Again, opening up to the universe of limitless possibilities. Very short, quick, fun story. I was in Australia leading a retreat and we went to Alice Springs. Well, Alice Springs is home to Ayers Rock. So I had all of these guys with me. We're going to Ayers Rock. We weren't going to do naked yoga there. We're just going, you know, playing tourists. It was the tourist part of the Australian trip. We pull up to the gate, four o'clock in the morning. Guard goes, are you those naked guys? <laughs> no, no, like, that's thunder down under. That's different. <laughs> we're in the middle of the outback, in the middle of nowhere. Oh are you gosh. the nudies? <laughs> 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 so my reputation preceded me. Uh, <laughs> I see that. Yeah. We're quickly running out of time, but I've got to ask because it's, it's the question that's been hanging out there for me for almost the entire interview. But Going back to the stretching part of things, because obviously I am focused, uh, as you can tell, because mm -hmm. I'm blown away by all this. But yeah, th this is such a different way of thinking of how yeah. to do yoga and things like that. How what's been the the reception in the yoga mm -hmm. community? Because I can't imagine a lot of people being real happy with what you're trying to teach out there. Yeah, and I think that probably a good fit, thirty to fifty percent um, think I'm the devil incarnate or something. Right, mm. right. Um, you know, and it, it's threatening. It's threatening to them because the question, "Who am I if I'm not teaching?" You know, how am I going to teach yoga if I'm not teaching stretching? Uh, and and so that is a big problem for a lot of people to kind of like wrap their heads around. Also, like I met this one woman who works in the gym and part of her job is to stretch people and here she is thinking she's doing a service and then she kind of finds out from me that she's not um actually and i just want to kind of just say one thing really quick that we can actually test muscle function so we can test you are strong and then when you stretch and you're going to test weak and i've done a I've done this countless times and it's, and I've actually got a whole thing where I can get people to do it to themselves. You can test your own 
sort of force output. And you feel the difference uh, quite dramatically, actually, um, what happens before you stretch and after you stretch. So, that, that, but, but I would also say like 30 to 50% of people doing yoga recognize at some level or at a deep level that what they're doing is not supporting them. What they're doing is actually making them worse. But the yoga, the stretching part of it feels good, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so this is like, you, if you ask a lot of yoga teachers, why do we stretch? Well, because you feel good. Well, my response is doing a line of cocaine makes you feel good. You don't <laughs> see us all running around right. doing cocaine. Like, mm -hmm. like just because something makes you feel good, that should never be the answer about why we do something. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. So that's it's I would say it's like a 50 50 thing. A lot of people are very interested, but it is definitely making some waves. <laughs> mm, I, bet. I can only imagine. Yeah. But it kind of makes sense because if you think like a rubber band, you know, if you stretch it too much, then mm -hmm. it, it breaks or it doesn't work or it gets all, you know, funky. So was it was it what's term you used? Uh, discombobulated? Discombobulated, yeah, the, 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 the term of the day. I right? have a wampus. <laughs> <laughs> and throw a juggernaut in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> now, um, Yogi Aaron, do you still teach yoga to people in person or online or anything? Mm -hmm. Other than I know you've got your content on your website, but you still do teach yep. that. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the content I actually film is when I'm with teaching students. Like I just mm -hmm. finished doing a teacher training and. I filmed a lot of content while I was doing the teacher trainings. I do a lot of travel. I teach, you know, in different studios. I teach at yoga festivals. My main area of teaching is at Blue Osa, the yoga retreat I have in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And we do yes, teacher please. trainings there. And... Oh, I thought, you, I thought you invited us. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm hearing things. Sorry about that. No, okay. <laughs> Come down and we'll film a radio episode. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> No. Yeah, so I am teaching. Yes. Okay. Well, awesome. Right. Well, we're going to lay in all those links directly on show notes. All you need to do is go to skepticmetaphysician.com, go to his episode page. You'll see all those links there so you can connect with Yogi Aaron directly. His stuff is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. It's been blowing my mind this entire interview. So I'm <laughs> thrilled that we got the chance to talk with you because I never knew how badly I didn't know how to do yoga. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe you understand a little bit about why it was causing you so much pain to try and stretch, mm -hmm. you know, and I think this is one of the biggest things as well. Like in the yoga world, we talk about how yoga is about creating a safe space. It's about honoring our bodies. And yet when we're stretching, we're actually violating our body's own protective, self-protective mechanisms. And what we should do instead is honor those protective mechanisms and address the cause of why it's tightening up and that's where I come in. <laughs> My, the, the typical story of East versus West, Eastern yes. medicine versus mm -hmm. Western mm -hmm. medicine. So this has been fascinating. Yogi yes. Aaron, thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. I am really looking forward to reintroducing myself to yoga because now that sounds mm. like stuff that I might want to do. I, I might be able to do yeah. to start with. So you thank you for that. Stiff Biff to Bendy Wendy. <laughs> 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 Care me to I love out. it. No, no. <laughs> I can't believe you just went there. <laughs> I, I think we might have found our uh, episode title. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, Yogi Aaron, thank you so much for coming on. It's been thank fun. You. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And a huge thank you to you. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. If you did and you feel called to give back, we invite you to visit our website at skepticmetaphysician.com where you can donate to the show or subscribe as a member through our Buy Me a Coffee campaign. Your support will go a long way towards allowing Karen and I to bring you these wonderful conversations and teachings in more and more robust ways. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care. <laughs>